Thank you, Liam and Tegan. We love you guys. Thank you for starting us off this evening. Sometimes you make us laugh. Sometimes you make us cry. Sometimes you make us do both at the same time, which is a real gift. All righty. Good evening, Teen Streeters. Welcome to the main session. And we are so stoked that you are tuning in with us here this evening. Before we get into our content and, and start delving into what we're looking at tonight, I just wanna give you a little bit of information, a little bit of an update. So you may have seen on our Teen Street app, there is a link there called Teen Street TV. Can we encourage you guys just to jump on that, hit that and watch the videos? Now you'll find some, uh, I guess, archive videos of some very comedic, uh, people, Dan and Sam, when back in the day they did the Dan and Sam videos. If you are in for a laugh, if you're wanting a laugh, you'll find heaps of them if you watch those videos. But we also have on the Teen Street TV uh, daily videos of our Teen Streets that we've done here in Australia for the past 10 or so years. And if you, this is your first time tuning in to Teen Street Australia and you're doing it first time online, we just would love for you guys to check out those videos because that will give you a really great snapshot as to what we would normally do at a Teen Street if we were able to gather. And you'll see the heartbeat of this Teen Street Australia, and you'll be able to get an idea as to what to expect if, Lord willing, we are able to meet uh, next year. So jump on Teen Street TV and enjoy the viewing. A few other things just to bring to your attention in regards to the app. We've done a few updates as Teen Street has been happening, and you'll notice that on the menu link, there is a, um, an, an option there now for resources. And if you hit that, what you will find is access to a PDF version of our study guide. So what we're looking at in our net groups. So if you're wanting an electronic version of that, that's where you can access. And what you can also access through the resources link is um, a link to, to purchase our merchandise. You may have seen some of the team wearing the t-shirts and the hoodies with the Teen Street 2020 and the Joseph logo on the back. If you're wanting to, to have your own um, own cop uh, version of that, if you're wanting to have your own hoodie or your own T-shirt, uh, you can buy them through that link. So make yourself available of that as well. And just to kind of um, highlight and reflect on where we've been so far, we've had a great time together. And uh, yesterday's equip sessions, we, we ran them for the first time yesterday and we were sharing this morning and Andrew was sharing his experience of hosting Dan Smith, the Olympian, and just how rich that session was and, and just how, um, just what he, what the comments were happening in the chat. And if you are in those equip sessions, make sure you, you avail yourself of and, and link into to the session in the chat, there might be options to ask questions or, or give a, a response or, or give your own insight, your own experience. But Dan Smith's one just really, um, I guess, it touched the heart of, of, of Andrew and he was just so, uh, he was loving to just watch how um, Dan sharing his story of coming from a place of brokenness to a place of restoration because of Christ just entering in, into his life and meeting him at a moment where he needed him the most. Um, we, we hear in that we saw in the chat that there was um, a lot that resonated with a lot of us um, at Teen Street as we were chiming in. So if you haven't signed up for an equip session tomorrow afternoon, make sure you do that before you head to bed tonight. Um, there is a, a great options are still available. So make sure you register and then that will come on your schedule where you can then just join in when the time is right. All right. So we are in the story of Joseph. And Last night we looked at the, the theme for our night was promises threatened. And I'm a visual learner. And if there's visual learners out there, you will understand how important it is to have something visual where you can take and you can put it in your mind's eye and you can remember a point. Now promises threatened. So here we have some chains. Now, Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. He was sold out by the people who were closest to him. And I just think, wow, what would that mean if I was sold out by my brothers and my sister? That would just hurt. And yet that was a threat in Joseph's life that was present and he was sold into slavery. So we have the chain. Now, as the story progressed, we see Joseph being sold into slavery, but then being bought by a dude 
um, who's a, an Egyptian official. Now, here we have something which is our next visual aid. Now, if I was to ask you, what is this? Hopefully you're saying into your screens right now, that's a pot, sir. And you'd be right, it is a pot. So well done, 10 billion points for you. But what's inside? Now, hopefully you're saying, oh, that's fur, sir. Oh, you guys are geniuses. Yes, it's fur. So if we put it all together, we have a pot of fur. Get it? Hey, get it? I know that's a really, really daggy, daggy dad joke, but that is killing here where we are filming and I hope you're laughing at home. And it is a daggy dad joke, but let's face it, I'm on the comms team with a bunch of dads. So the daggy dad jokes were, about to, were bound to rub off at some point. So we saw that uh, Joseph's story, found him, he found himself in Potiphar's household and there was Potiphar's wife who was a bit of a schemer. And what she did was she kind of, uh, um, set up Joseph um, to be wrongfully accused of sexual misconduct. And as a result, Potiphar wasn't a happy man and he threw Joseph in jail. So we have Joseph was thrown into a pit and then Joseph found himself and he was thrown into um, uh, prison. And I just sort of think, wow, big threats for Joseph. Yet you might remember last night when Dan encouraged us, and this is our third visual aid, to have a right size view of God. Now, how good are these binoculars? Now, I know they're not as fancy as the, the ones that we had on the, the screen last night. And you might say, hey, Sarah, that's two toilet paper rolls taped to some sunglasses. And you'd be right, but let's use our imagination teen streeters. They look like binoculars and they actually, like I wasn't expecting them to work, they do work. So if you've got a spare toilet paper, at, um, toilet paper rolls at home, you feel free to, to make your own version. But what we looked at when uh, Dan was talking about the binoculars is that we need to have a right sized view of God. And when we have that right sized view of God, we see that these threats are brief in a big, long, overarching story. And God is writing this overarching story, this long, story of, 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 of rescue and redemption. It's the story that he promised back in Genesis 3. There's this long narrative of God's story. And underneath that, there are these sub stories that happen. And we've seen that in the Bible, the sub story of Adam and Eve, the sub story of Noah, the sub story of Abraham, and now the sub story of Joseph. They are small stories in this long overarching story of redemption that God is writing. And these threats are brief in the big story. And the threats are big and we're, we're not devaluing that. We know the threats are big, but remember what we looked at last night. God is bigger. God is bigger Teen Street. And He is advancing His redemption story. And that can just bring us such comfort when we find ourselves in the pits. And God's story of redemption is not going to be obscured by any darkness. You might remember the verse that Dan shared with us, John 1 verse 14. We need a right perspective. So let's take that right perspective as we now journey into the next instalment of Joseph's story. But let's first take a look of what that story is by watching our animation video. Day three, promises fulfilled. Joseph remained in the Pharaoh's prison for a long while as both a prisoner and head of the other convicts when one day he was joined by two more inmates. One was Pharaoh's baker and the other a high-ranking officer in the royal court who checked that the Pharaoh's drinks weren't poisoned. He was called a cupbearer. Both had greatly offended their master and were sent to prison where the captain of the prison guard assigned them to stay with Joseph. The three stayed together for some time when one night both the baker and the cupbearer received dreams in their sleep. When they told Joseph, he replied, Don't dreams belong to God? Please tell me what you saw and I will tell you what they mean. Joseph explained the pair's dreams to them, saying that in three days the cupbearer will receive his job back, but the baker will be executed. Joseph also said to the cupbearer, Please, when this happens and the Pharaoh is pleased with you. Mention my name to him. Tell him that I am innocent, 
so I may be freed from this prison? Three days later, what Joseph said came true exactly for each man. However, as time went on, the cupbearer forgot Joseph and never mentioned his name nor innocence to Pharaoh. Two years after this happened, Pharaoh was awoken in the night by two greatly troubling dreams. The next morning he called all of Egypt's magicians and wise men to make sense of his visions, but none could help. When this happened, the cupbearer remembered Joseph and told Pharaoh he could possibly help. Hearing this, Pharaoh sent for Joseph, who had now been in prison for a very long time. When he questioned Joseph about his abilities, Joseph said, It's not for me who will make sense of your dreams, but God through me. He explained the Pharaoh's dreams to him, saying that Egypt will experience seven years of healthy crops and bountiful harvests, followed by seven years of dry lands, hunger and famine. Pharaoh would need to appoint a wise man to look over Egypt and direct the people to store one-fifth of their harvests in preparation for the famine. The Pharaoh was very pleased by Joseph's insight, and decided that he should be his wise right-hand man, for he saw the Spirit of God in Joseph. Later he gave him even more power than he'd given him before, promoting Joseph to second in charge over everything under Pharaoh's control, and giving him a wife, riches and power to lead Egypt in preparation for what was to come. I love to play video games, and I'm sorry for you Xbox people out there, but I'm a PlayStation kid, and I'm actually super excited about the new PlayStation 5 coming out. So I just wanted to tell you about a couple of games I love to play. Um, I love to play FIFA with my friends because you can play as a team, and I just love to play soccer anyway. So that's that's my, one of my favorite games, but I also love to play RPG games. Um, and there's something addicting about a good RPG. Now, RPG game stands for role-playing games for you non nerds and geeks out there and the idea is that you start off as a character who's at level one with no experience or equipment or, um, or abilities and you and you and you journey through the storyline and you gain experience and equipment and things things necessary to level up to level two three four etc in order that you can take out and fight against the big bad guys at the end that's the idea of an rpg and i like to think of joseph's journey of maturity kind of like an RPG where Joseph starts out at level one we saw him yesterday a bit of a bit of a chump and we're seeing him level up now there's somebody in my life who is also at level one and uh, I'm gonna bring her into the shot right here this is this is my baby girl Zara say hi to the people hi. <laughs> yeah Zara is just gone six months and uh, some of you guys knew that uh, Jasmine my wife was uh, pregnant uh, when uh, we are at Teen Street last year and it's crazy to be uh, a year later and we got a little baby and so she's the reason why we're in Canada and so Zara is on level one. She can roll over and she can, yeah, she's just fantastic. We just love her so much. So Zara is on level one, kind of like Joseph in yesterday's series. Now we, we're picking up in um, uh, the last two day series and now we're picking up the journey and Joseph is growing in maturity but he's only he's probably only at level 13 maybe I'm gonna she's just dancing I'm gonna give her back <laughs> there you go love so Joseph is growing in maturity but he's not quite there yet um, in order to to face his brothers and to face um, some greater challenges down the road down the journey he has to be at least a level like 45 or something like that. At the moment, he's probably around a level 13. And the reason why I say this is because in Genesis chapter 40, verse 14, it says this. But when all goes well with you, this is Joseph talking to the, uh, to the, to the baker and cupbearer. Remember me and show me kindness. Re uh, mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews and... And even here, I've done nothing to deserve being put in dungeon. So why is this a bad thing to say? Well, I don't think it's necessarily sinful or anything like that. But it just shows that he doesn't trust God to get him out of prison. It's not bad. He's just, in, he's trying to do it out of his own strength. Do you know what I mean? So if we compare this to Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16, compare 
what we just heard with this. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake and the, that the foundations of the prison were shaking. Uh, at, all at once, uh, at once the, all the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains became loose. Now, if God wants Joseph out of the prison, out of the dungeon, he'll get him out. In the same way that he wanted Paul and Silas out of the dungeon, he can do any, any of a million things, but he chose an earthquake of all things. Paul and Silas had absolute trust, absolute confidence that God had, they were in God's hands, even in the prison. Joseph feels like he's been hard done by, and, and he has, that's fair, but he doesn't ultimately trust God to get him out, and, and he's trying to get out on his own strength. The main takeaway is this. When you think about your spiritual maturity, your spiritual journey with God as you grow with Jesus, think of it kind of like an RPG game where sometimes it's good to be reminded that we are journeying, we've come some distance, but we're not there yet. We're not perfect yet. We, we've still got some things to learn and grow in in order for us to face some of the things that are waiting for us down a, around a couple corners in, in life. Some challenges in our life that are coming, and they're coming, are going to be really, really hard. And God is taking through us through some things right now that are really difficult in order so that when we get to that point, we will be able to face them with absolute faith and confidence in Jesus. So my advice is this, is, is that your life and my life is about God and is not ultimately about us. And so the advice is to let God lead you and take you through the challenges of life and for you and I to learn quickly from them uh, and, and quickly from him because he has always got something greater down the journey in, for us to experience. But there's, there's a reason why he's taking us through these things right now. So Joseph is on a learning curve. We're on a learning curve. So my advice to you is to trust in Jesus. I might, uh, might need to get Sarah to, to work on those uh, binoculars. Thank you for lending them to me though, Sarah. I do want you to right now uh, imagine uh, that, uh, that tonight you're sitting at home and all of a sudden you get a phone call and it's the Prime Minister's office and uh, they have sent an entourage to collect you, uh, to take you to Canberra, wherever you are, that might include a plane trip, and, uh, and you are called in, the, the, the Secret Service or whatever the Aussie version is, the special police, the federal police usher you, you're taken in a convoy of cars to Parliament House and you're ushered down through the halls of Parliament and you come to the room where the Prime Minister is sitting and you've been getting ready for this moment and you walk in and there the Prime Minister is and you sit down across the, the way at his desk and he says to you, I hear you've found out a solution to how we can respond to this COVID crisis. Can you tell me what we must do? Now that would be a pretty big thing for any of us to be faced with, correct? I mean, that, that would be really intense. Well, tonight we have uh, just covered this story and Callum was just covering a little bit more of the Joseph story of where he's up to because there is this moment uh, in Joseph's life and, and Sarah un unraveled or unpacked a little bit um, in her recap of what he has gone through, sold into slavery by his own brothers. He was in a pit, left to die. Now he's in Potiphar's house and then he's falsely accused of sexual misconduct. And now he's languishing in a pit. Years have gone by. He was a teenager when he was sold into slavery. And here he is about 30 years old. And the next moment, uh, the, the jail doors open up and he is brought, ushered into the presence of the most powerful person probably in the world that, at that time, the king of Egypt. This is crazy to go from prison uh, to the palace of the king in, in, in just a few moments. I believe he had to get shaved and get ready to stand in the presence of the king. 
And when he's standing there, uh, we read in Genesis chapter 41, verse uh, 15, it says that Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream and no one can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Wow. This is his big moment. He's on the big stage. He's playing with the big blast. I mean, he's just been in jail with the riffraff. Now he's standing in the presence of the most powerful man on the planet. What's he going to do? Come on, Joseph, this is your time to shine. What's he going to say next? Well, he says something that is really quite profound. Something that I don't think you would get in your leadership books today. The advice on what to do in job interviews, how to sell yourself well. What does Joseph say? We read it. He said, I cannot do it. What? What did you say? He said, I can't do it. Joseph, this is your big opportunity. You're standing before the king, the most powerful. This is your opportunity to sell yourself. Big note yourself. This is the, the, your time to shine. And he says, I can't do it. And then he follows that up with, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Uh, Teen Street, I just think this is absolutely incredible. Callum has just described the journey that, that Joseph has been on. He's leveling up. God is doing a work of sanctification in his life. God is refining him over these years. He went from a pretty arrogant teenager who thought he was the center of the story. And God has been doing a work in his life. We know he was gifted. God had given him the capacity to interpret dreams. Uh, he was uh, a hard worker skillful guy and here he is in this moment he, God has done such a work in him when he has the opportunity to get the glory for himself to try and big note himself he forgets himself almost in this moment really because he gives God the glory it's not about Joseph it's all about God And this is the challenge for us in a day and age where we are encouraged to assert our authority, uh, throw your weight around, push yourself into those situations, climb the corporate ladder, wield your power and assert your authority. And there's a guy in the New Testament called the Apostle Paul who too, who he was also, uh, Callum just made reference to him. He also was a really gifted guy, really smart, really intelligent. He was very religious as well, very zealous for his uh, Jewish religion. And he was very passionate about it. And the thing is, when you're highly trained and naturally gifted as he was, you can tend to become dependent on your own self. And this was the way the first century operated back when Jesus walked on the earth and when these apostles were ministering, the normal thing was to boast in your gifts, boast in your talents, big note yourself, to be the top dog. But something had happened in the apostle Paul's life. Jesus, the good and gracious king, had gripped his life. And he was transformed on the road to Damascus, so much so that, that his whole perspective on how he went about life had shifted. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 30, he says, if I must boast, he's writing to a church that had division and it was uh, boasting about all sorts of things. There was a pride issue. And he said, if I must boast, I will boast of the things that show what? My weakness. You see, when we get a glimpse of God's greatness and his goodness, uh, we get the perspective right, like those binoculars. All of a sudden we realize, hey, I'm really small. I'm not the center of the show. And my life is all about bringing God glory. I must decrease, as John the Baptist wrote once, he said once, and God must increase. 
And that is what our lives are to be all about now. In that moment when Joseph said those words to Pharaoh, he was speaking the words of someone who was humble, who knew who God was and knew who he was in God. And this is the place of maturity is when we are secure in the arms of Jesus, knowing our identity is not found in what we do. It's in what Jesus has done for us. It's a place of security and wholeness. We don't have to prove ourselves to anyone, but we can rest in the fact that God loves us. He sent his son to die for us. And now we can live to glorify him. Teen Street, the place of maturity is when we can stand in a room when normally we would be uh, trying to big note ourselves and all we want to do is bring God glory like Joseph did that day. And we say, I can't do it, but God can. It's like what the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He says, for when I am weak, then I am strong. And today I want to encourage us to be putting our confidence in God. It's all about Him. In a culture which wants to big note us, ourselves, to, to, to throw our weight around, to be proud, we must decrease and He must increase. And someone uh, who's going to share a little bit of his story with us is the Teen Street director, Andrew Carnell. Uh, Andrew Tell us, I mean, this is a challenging story about Joseph. I mean, you hear him standing before Pharaoh. What's your journey been like with this? Well, I think what you've just mentioned is such an important aspect of the Christian life that we need to understand that I can't, we can't, but God can. And that is so important to grab hold of. I, I, I get back. I just want to speak a little bit about my journey in terms of even public speaking. Um, in year 12... At the school, I was at the biggest school. I was made captain of the soccer team. And as soon as I was made captain of the soccer team, I knew that I had to speak at this sports dinner where all the sports um, and all the families, the principals, dignitaries, they were all going to be there. But I had to do a speech because I was the captain of the soccer team. Just a small one. But as soon as I was captain, I was fearful because I knew that day was coming. And so I had to do a speech and I remember just freaking out before I had to do it. I just wrote it out on a piece of paper. I'm sure I just stood there, <laughs> read the piece of paper and went and sat down. Um, and so what, I, what it speaks to me is the way God works in our lives to now be at a point where I can speak pub publicly. And um, I know every time I stand up to speak publicly, I can't do it. I really can't. And, and I'm not joking. I'm not just saying that. Like I sometimes be in the preparation before speaking say, say to God, I can't do this. I, I actually can't. Um, but in the beauty of that actually, and it's incredible, and the longer I do it, the more I experience it, is God comes into that place. And, and I have spoken in places where I can only say this was God helping me. It was His grace, uh, His help, His empowerment. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He helps us do things that we never thought we could. And um, I actually believe that's a critical aspect of the Christian life. No matter what we do, um, to recognise we can do nothing unless we're dependent upon Him mm. and to find ourselves in that place. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's an amazing thing because it's counter to our culture, isn't it? It's, it's a different perspective. It's a big view of God and it's a small view of ourselves in the great scheme of things. It liberates us as well. You're free then. It's true because, you know, when I was fearful, um, if you look at why, it was because I was fearful about what other people would think of me. I was fearful about the fact that I didn't have the ability. But when we let go of that and recognise, well, it's not about me, it's about God, and it's about what God wants to do. Um, there's a liberation in that. And the other aspect that is really important, that when I know God is in control and He helped me, there's no way I can take any credit or any glory. It can only be like, and I, again, literally, I would say I, that was God. I can't do it. It's, it's Him. And He is strong in my weakness. So it leads to humility and it leads to, I'm giving God glory and people see how God is good and not me or any other person. And as I'm speaking to the teens, I'd probably just say, I actually hope that you find yourselves in, in places 
where you feel uncomfortable. I feel God calls us to do things where it feels uncomfortable. In those places, young people, I want to say, trust God. You can't, but this is where you get to experience God because when you obey Him and when you walk into those things He's calling you to, you will experience His grace and His power and His enabling according to your gifts. You know, for me, it has been speaking, but for others, it'll be any number of different things that God's calling each of us to. But we want to do that with God's grace helping us and empowering us. And that comes when we stop and say, Lord, I can't do this. I need your help. Yeah, it's a good word. It's a really challenging thing. It sounds simple, but when the eyes are on us, when we make ourselves the centre of the story, it's a huge weight. It's a huge burden on our shoulders. But then you hear the freedom of Joseph and the freedom that, that Andrew has just talked about. When you can say that I can't, but God can, you're free. It's true. And, and it's a God's story then. It's not a Andrew's story, a Joseph's story. It becomes God's story, which we all want to see and be a part of. It's awesome. Have you ever been rock climbing maybe with your school trip or youth group or something like that and it was your turn to go and you start climbing up and you get to a part that is just impossible. You're stuck and, and you're halfway up the rock and you know you can't go any further and your friends and your peers and the instructors down on the ground and they're all yelling up at you. You can do it. You can do it. We believe in you. You're the best. You can do it. And you're just thinking, no, I can't. I, I'm, I'm stuck. I'm, I'm physically unable. And now I'm emotionally unable because I'm panicking. I'm kind of freaking out a little bit. I'm not sure if you've been in that situation. I think I know I have. But I want to liken that to life. And I want to give you a piece of advice. And the advice is going to sound really, really strange because you've, the world doesn't tell you this. Um, and it's a little bit weird, but it's a, probably the best advice you'll ever hear. And the piece of advice is this. You can't do it. Even though the people are yelling at you, you can do it. You cannot do it. And by it, I mean life. And I'm not just saying this to be mean or cruel, but it's because the Bible says this. It says that you, while you were, it says in Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Why did Jesus have to die for us? Because we were so stuck in our sin that we couldn't rescue ourselves. You cannot uh, rescue yourself. You cannot clean yourself from your sin. You cannot uh, be successful enough to satisfy yourself. You cannot um, make yourself happy. You can't do any of this stuff. And it sounds so strange because the world around you, your, the, the, your teachers, your coaches, your, the, your favorite celebrities are all telling you, you can do it. And here I am saying you can't. But it's the most freeing piece of advice because it helps us to go to the one who can do it. Not only did Jesus free us from our sin, but he freed us to live a new life in him. Now, let me explain. Pull out your phone um, in, out of your pocket right now. Hold it in front of you. Now, have you ever been out at youth group or out at a friend's party or something like that and your phone has died on you and you, you try to call for a ride or you try to watch a video on YouTube or something like that and it's just died on you? How useful in that moment, how useful is your phone? None. You might have Google Maps downloaded. You might have, like I said, YouTube downloaded. You might have music on there. You might have whatever. You have all the stuff in there. All the potential is there, but it's dead. How useful is it? We well, can't access it. You can't get into it because it's, there's no life there. Well, life without Jesus is like that phone. The world is full of dead phones trying to save themselves, trying to free themselves from their sin, from their boredom, from all this, all a bunch of stuff. Now, when we look at our phone as a dead phone, and, and we, we, we take that phone and we plug in the power, the electricity into that phone, that, that phone goes from being completely dead, no fun at all, useless to you, uh, and useless to everyone around you. As soon as you put the spark of electricity in there, boom, all of a sudden, Ever, all the potential within that phone is released to you, is now able to function the way it was designed to function. We are like that phone. And I know you guys saw this coming, but phones have apps that are like games. I have Boom Beach downloaded on my phone. It's just a fun game. And I have maps and the phone capacity. I can call, I can Skype. I can do so much on my phone when it has life in it. As long as it's dead, it cannot do anything on its own. 
The world is full of dead phones trying to be useful, trying to be fun, trying to be all these things, and they're ultimately failing because they have no life in them. And life comes from Jesus. I want to encourage you. This might sound like the most craziest piece of advice, but you cannot do it. You can't breathe life into yourself. But Jesus has come to free you from your sin and has come to free you to himself, which is the most life-giving thing that could ever happen. Jesus comes in and dwells in each of us when we put our trust in him and he reproduces his life within us. We are free to uh, all the potential that is inside when that life is in us. Hopefully when I say you can't do it, that now makes sense. But with Jesus, you can do abundantly more than you could have ever done on your own. Oh, thank you, Callum, for, for bringing us that. And just how you finish it off there. You can't do it, but Jesus can. Now, we've heard those words repeated a few times throughout our time together this evening. Joseph said, him, said those words to Pharaoh. And this was, as Dan said, this was his moment. This was Joseph's moment to, to stand before the most powerful man of that time and, and perhaps promote himself. Now, I am a tragic musical nerd. I love musicals. And musical nerds like me across the world was probably a week ago, we tuned into Disney Plus and we watched the streamed version of the musical Hamilton. I loved it because I've, I've always loved Hamilton and I'm, I'm looking forward to um, coming to Australia. Fingers crossed. And there's a time in that musical where Alexander Hamilton, he sings a song says that, which is called My Shot. And in it, he's like, I'm not gonna throw away my shot. I'm not throwing this away. This is my moment. This is my moment to promote myself from, now he was an orphan. He had a, a wretched beginning and all of a sudden, but he had a brain and all of a sudden he found himself standing before George Washington and he's like, yes, this is my moment and I'm gonna take it. And then there's another character in the musical called Aaron Burr, and he's also a little bit of a, I'm wanting my shot as well. And that's a common theme throughout the musical, is that you've got these men who are the forefathers of America, the ones who established America as a separate colony from Britain. And then they're there and we're like, yes, we're gonna, this is our shot, we're gonna take it. Yet when Joseph stood before the most powerful man of Egypt, he threw away his shot because he's like, he realised, he had the perspective, he realised it's not about me. And even if it was about me, I can't do it, but God can. And he diverted all the glory, just like Dan said, he diverted all the glory onto God and showed that it was God that can do what Pharaoh was asking, not Joseph. You can't, but Jesus can. We heard it again in Andrew's testimony when he, when he told us that he, he was chosen for this role at school, which meant that he had to stand in front of people. And, and, but that's a situation that just paralyzes him. And he's, not, and he's like, I can't do it. And when he came to that moment where he realized I can't do it, God's like, yeah, you can't, but I can. And God has because Andrew has stood before people, but it's not in Andrew's strength that he stands before people, it's in God's strength that he stands before people. You can't, but Jesus can. And we need to resist the temptation to believe you can. Our culture floods us with that, that message. We see it in our news feeds. We see it in marketing campaigns, you know, just do it, the Nike tick. Netflix series, we can binge watch Netflix series, which tells us you can, as a human, you can. Our iTunes playlists are full of songs where it's all about you can. A constant message, it's everywhere. You can, you can, you can. I guess if one thing that COVID has taught us is that we can't. When we thought, as humans, when we thought we could do stuff, one virus has literally 
paralyzed humanity's ability to do anything. When we think of restrictions, everything has shut down. And God's like, I told you, you can't. God's like, this is what I mean when, you, when He says you can't in the Bible. One virus has turned humanity upside down. And God's like, yeah, I know, because you can't. And it's like when we believe that lie that we can, it's like we're on a treadmill. Now, I, I think I remember joining a gym once. Clearly, I loved it. Look at my face, I'm lying. Uh, and, and I often would divert myself to, to the treadmill because that seems like where a lot of the people went. I just don't get the idea of a treadmill. Like that, that thing is torture. It's a torture implement. Because you're walking, but you're not getting anywhere. You're just doing this. That's all I could do. I can't run on a treadmill. I, I, I would die. Um, but that's like what it is when we believe the you can lie. It's like we're on a treadmill. We're not getting anywhere. We're not moving, but we're becoming exhausted. Just like Dan said, it is a huge burden. It is a huge weight to carry the you can lie. And humanity is being crippled by it. We see it, depression, anxiety, stress, overwork. You are, we have been crippled by this lie. But you can was never God's plan. Jesus was. And as Callum so richly put it just then, is that when humanity, it's like the dead phone, when humanity was like, I'm gonna try and, and, and fulfill myself like I need to be. It's just, it's, that's not how it's meant to be. And God knew this and that's why He sent Jesus because you can't, but Jesus can. He is the one that, that puts life back into us. And that, that, that image that Callum has given us is just so stunning. It's the life of Jesus in us, which brings us to life. And we find ourselves in situations that are definitely out of our comfort zone and we're operating not in our strength, but we're operating in the strength that God gives us. We are weak, like Paul says, we are weak, but God is strong. And there's a verse in the Bible that just punctuates this beautifully. It's found in Galatians 5 verse one. It says, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Stand firm and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Jesus came so we could be free of that burden, that heaviness, that weight, which was never ours to carry. Jesus came so that we can have freedom and we can live free. We can get off the you can treadmill and we can just be free of that. And, and it's just, it's when you think about it, we need to then translate this into our lives and we need to ask ourselves, are we in slavery? Are we burdened or are we free? Teen Street, God wants you to be free. He wants you to be free. The consequences of being a slave it's like what I said before, it's the stress, it's the anxiety, it's the worry, it's just this feeling that you're carrying the weight of the world. That's a plot of the enemy. The Bible says that the enemy comes to kill, kill, steal and destroy. Our enemy does not want us to be free. He wants us to be burdened. He wants us to continue believing the lie that you can because he knows that we are, when we do that, we have been held back from everything that God has for us. We've been held back from everything that God wanted for us. And that's the enemy's plan, kill, steal and destroy. But God's plan is for freedom. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. So I'm gonna ask you again, are you free or are you a slave? And how we know to answer that is when it comes by us removing ourselves from the throne, from the centre of our lives, 
in that humble submission. And, and there's a beautiful um, quote that I just heard of um, when I was at on online church the other day. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. It is thinking of yourself less. It is taking us from that centre, being me-centric and removing us from that and going, I can't, but God can. And it's in that humble submission in when we, like Joseph, when we acknowledge that we can't. He said it to Pharaoh. And in that moment, that's when we become the mirror that we reflect God's glory. Because that's what we were designed to do. That's what God wants us, is to be free to be a mirror and reflect His glory. And then we let Jesus lead and move on our behalf. He becomes the life within us. We can't, but Jesus can. And how that translates into our lives is by having the same perspective as Joseph. And that is the key to our freedom. I'm going to ask that we try a little bit of a, and, and um, facilitate a response. Now, this might be tricky because of the context by which we are gathering here tonight. But to do this, you'll need a, a piece of paper and a pen. And you could use a, a portion of your booklet that might be free. Or if you have a piece of paper close by, please grab that. And in this time where we just reflect on the reality that we can't, but Jesus can. I invite you to write on your piece of paper these words. Firstly, I invite you to write, I can't. I can't. And then we're gonna cross that out because if anything we have heard here tonight is that is the truth. We can't. But then I want you to write, but God can. I can't, but God can. And then I would love for you to just sit and look at what that means and allow God to just speak in this moment as we are just letting this message land with us as we're hearing from God and allow God to just seep that into everything, every part of our life. I can't, but God can. And if you are courageous and if you are brave, I'm going to ask you to do something a little extra. If you are wanting to let this be your life message and you're wanting to broadcast this just like Joseph did in front of Pharaoh. I'm gonna ask you to take a photo of what you have written. And if you are brave and if you feel comfortable with doing so, there's no obligation for you to do this. This is just something that we thought of might be cool to see on social media is you can post it to your socials. If that's a little bit too much for you, that's fine. But maybe what you can do is when you meet in your net groups later on tonight, you can show your net, your words. You can hold it up to the camera and say, I can't, but God can. And in that moment, your net group can come around you and they can pray for you and they can champion you into allowing that to seep into every part of your life. That's an option for you now. But if none of those just resonate with you, the simple fact of writing, I can't, but God can. The most important person has seen that tonight. God has seen that. And God will use that, just like he did with Joseph. We're gonna move into a time of shh. So, um, and we're going to just continue in this thinking. Uh, 
So take your pieces of paper where you've written, I can't, but God can. And sometimes it's important for us to specify this, to make it particular to our own life. And one thing we would love for you to consider in your 10 minutes of silence is to maybe look at where this reality, where this truth can apply in your life, where you can immediately apply it when you leave your house next or when you leave this main session. And what I would love for you to consider is how is, is that particular situation and write that particular situation on your piece of paper. So it's almost like you are identifying, yeah, I can't in that, I can't in this situation, but God can. I'll give you an example of what I mean. One of mine is I can't make family member who has walked away from God. I can't make that family, family member come back to God, but God can. It's not in my power to do that, but it is totally in God's power to do that. Another one is I cannot be fulfilled by earthly treasures. I cannot find fulfillment by earthly treasures, but I can find fulfillment in God. Last one, I cannot have the dreams of my heart become a reality. I cannot do that, but God can. And so as we move into a time of shh, just before you even start to write, maybe just take a moment and say, Lord, identify those situations so that I can articulate it on a piece of paper. Go back to the verse of Galatians 5 verse 1. It was for freedom that Christ has set you free. Stand firm and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. We'll have that verse on the slide as time is happening. As we've done already at Teen Street, we just ask you to remain socially distant from your devices, from each other, and just allow God to speak in this moment because He is speaking Teen Street. He wants you to be free. And now is a time that we can just be free of that burden. So I'll give you five seconds to gather up your things just like I am here. And then we'll move into a time of shh time. Here's your five second countdown. Five, four, three, two, one, shh.